Enter the world of forensic science, the science of crime, where a suspect's guilt or innocence can hang on a single piece of evidence. Nobody should die that way. I've never seen anything that horrific. One of the duties of a pathologist is to determine the cause of death. Watch on mobile devices or the big screen. All for free. No subscription required. Download Veely now. If you had to pick one skill that characterizes the best forensic scientists, it might be curiosity. A driving curiosity to understand how things work and how people think, particularly how criminals think. Alec Johnson was a big fish in a small pond. He and his wife Judy owned a gas station restaurant on the edge of the Tyendinaga Reserve. The Johnsons were proud of their house and especially of their shiny finished floors. As things turned out, they were to be a forensic godsend. Usually, her husband locked the money in the house safe. But not tonight. Two rounders, each with long records of theft and robbery, figured Alex might have some money around the house. And as they drove that night, they had trouble on their minds. They reached the Johnson's house around five in the morning. To hide their identities, one of them wore an Elvis mask, the other a ski mask. Ski mask carried a Beretta 22 caliber semi-automatic, a mean little thing. Elvis wanted some kind of weapon too. Their plan was simple. Crash into the house, scare the bejesus out of the couple, and beat it with the loot. Alec and Judy were awakened by the sound of their door being smashed in. Ski Mask demanded money, but Alec wasn't going to give up the money he and Judy worked so hard for, not to a couple of pipsqueaks and ridiculous masks. Elvis screamed, shoot him. Meanwhile, Judy slipped down the stairs. Elvis said he didn't want to hurt her, he just wanted money. Because the banks were closed for Christmas, the briefcase brimmed with almost $10,000. The nearest house on the reserve was 15 minutes away.
Alec Johnson had been shot three times. He was alive, but barely. Something like this is really, really unusual. It's really unusual to have something this serious happen on the reserve. Uh, uh, when I got there, there was a couple of uh, Ontario Provincial Police officers there. Of course, they are uh, called initially for uh, backup because they didn't know really what we had. Uh, when I got there, there was two officers there protecting the scene. Uh, the ambulance had been there and gone. The Tyendinaga First Nations Police deal with keeping order and petty crimes. Given that this was a major crime, they called in the Ontario Provincial Police. Jim Eady gathers the clues at the crime site. Probably the most important uh, point of any uh, crime scene is the point of entry to the crime scene. Uh, historically, in my experience, also has been that that uh, part of the crime scene oftentimes uh, holds the best evidence that will be available. This is the high intensity part of the job. The bad guys are nervous, their sweat is running, their hearts are pumping. No matter how much planning they've done, this is where they usually slip up. 90% of the fingerprints Edie finds, he lifts from the point of entry. Emergency crews were intent on rushing Alec Johnson to a nearby hospital. As a result, most of the prints were trampled and smudged. But on the stairs leading up to the bedroom, Edie gets lucky. Partial prints from two different running shoes stand out beautifully against the Johnson's clean, shiny hardwood floors. Edie dusts them and photographs them. Edie finds three shell casings. These will be sent to the center for firearms analysis. In the kitchen, Edie finds a strange chunk of wood. What's it doing in the house? It looks like it's been broken off something larger. When I looked uh, around the outside of the house, I saw a broken sawhorse there, and it appeared that one of the uh, legs had been sawn, but pulled off the sawhorse. And uh, in this particular location, I could see footprints in snow leading to another sawhorse. And I felt uh, strongly at the time that those were probably footprints connected to one of the suspects in this uh, case. Did you know that footprints are 50 times more likely to help an investigator than fingerprints? Neither did I. Well, that footprint was about to become Exhibit A. Back at the Johnsons, Edie wants to make a cast of the print, but first he has to photograph it. Not an easy task given the brilliant white snow. But if he doesn't photograph it, he may find irregular details and funny little marks on the cast caused by wedges of mud or pieces of grass stuck to the shoe's sole. Edie is a master on the subject of shoes. He even gives lectures about them at the museum. Which one? The Bata Shoe Museum. Oh, no two things are made exactly the same, wear the same, break the same, or tear the same. And that applies uh, directly to shoes. Even modern day uh, shoes in modern processing plants are all come off the assembly line with their various uniquenesses, oftentimes microscopic. But I came to the uh, Bata Shoe Museum a couple of years ago, and I found some really interesting examples, or historical examples really, of evidence that people were aware of and collected and synthesized and processed uh, evidence of, of footprints because of the number of examples of, of, shall I say, deception, or at attempts at deception by the design of uh, shoes. One of the examples that we use here, the Aboriginal executioner's shoes, which are handmade again, the soles are, are designed with uh, emu feathers on the bottom. So it's impossible to follow the footprints or to make any discovery about the person who was the executioner because there are no useful footprints to, to make to draw any conclusions from. I guess you can understand Mr. Eady is passionate about his subject.
Edie prepares to make his cast of the footprint. It doesn't help that the temperature is rising and the snow is getting softer. Usually, he uses dental plaster. It's exceptionally hard and records very fine detail. But plaster is too heavy for snow. So the material Edie uses is flour sulfur. I very carefully take the uh, sulfur and I carefully pour the sulfur into the footprint. And as you can see, you end up with what appears to be, and in fact is, a puddle of sulfur in the snow. But in fact, what's happened is the instant that the sulfur touched the snow, it hardened, just like that. Judging by its treads, it looks like the kind of shoe an NBA point guard might wear, or a kid in the playground. You'd think that with all the running shoes around, somebody like Jim Eady would find it a curse. But because of the fierce competition among sneaker manufacturers, they're always changing their models, always coming up with new arrangements of swirls and circles and exotic soles. So different runs of shoes and different years have different patterns. So I took my cast, uh, the cast in sulfur, and I took it back to my office and photographed it. And I prepared uh, two, two copies of the photograph, actually a scale-sized copy of the uh, cast that I could work with. But I, I copied quite a number of uh, copies in a smaller version. And these were for distribution to the investigating officers because the, the, the uh, cast actually shows a, a very good uh, overall view of the details of the bottom of the shoe. It seems to match the partial footprint he found on the stairs leading up to the Johnson's bedroom. Meanwhile, Alec Johnson was in serious condition, with bullet wounds to the chest, leg, and head. At 4 p.m. on New Year's Day, investigators got one hell of a present. A message turned up on the OPP's Crime Stoppers line. Uh, in that break-in, uh, the one where the guy got shot, you ought to be looking at uh, two people by the names of uh, Pete Benedict and Frank Lanoue. Usually on Crime Stoppers, it's thieves telling on one another. That's probably what happened in this case. There isn't a lot of honor in the criminal culture. Police can't find a listing for Frank Lanoue but they find a Pete Benedict. The listing for Benedict is in Cornwall, about an hour's drive from the Johnsons. Lots of times, criminals live in one area and drive to another to do a job, but police have learned to spread their net a little wider. When Lewis and Detective Rick Myers pull up in front of Benedict's house, they see the red Pontiac the vehicle Judy Johnson thought she saw as she fled her home. Inside, investigators find a bundle of bills marked in what seems like Judy Johnson's hand and a Beretta 22 caliber handgun. Investigators find fingerprints all over the car Benedict's prints are found on the driver's side while someone else's prints are found all over the passenger side. We recorded a velocity of 907.3 feet per second. This is the type of firearm that was submitted. It's a small semi-automatic 22 caliber pistol that's made by the Beretta company and uh, it's clip loaded or magazine loaded. This is the magazine and this fits into the bottom or the magazine well of the firearm. What I have here is on the left hand side you'll see a portion of a center fire cartridge case and on the right hand side I have my test that I fired from a suspect firearm. And you'll see a small line running down that's the prism line that separates these two through the microscope. But what I'm looking at is a portion of each. And this is what we call breach face marks. 
And if you look at these lines or, or striations, uh, the way they run into each other, this would constitute a match. It was quite, quite a simple matter in that particular case for me to match up the, uh, the cartridge cases to that particular firearm. But the fingerprints, the bundles of money, even the gun which matches the bullets found at the scene are circumstantial evidence. Investigators know a good lawyer could find explanations for all those things that would give Benedict a sizable loophole. They need to find the sneakers. But Benedict's closet holds no sneakers. The only sneakers in the room are a pair of brand new filas Benedict is wearing, and the soles don't match the flyer at all. Maybe Benedict isn't the perpetrator. Frustrated, the investigators ask Benedict about Frank Lanoue. Benedict insists he never heard of him. As he gestures, investigators notice something glittery on Benedict's finger, a new ring. Benedict is asked to empty his pockets. Among the contents, they find a receipt, dated the day of the robbery. There's no tax on the purchase because as a native, Benedict is exempt from tax. The ring, it turns out, is from a jewelry store in a mall an hour away. On a hunch, investigators decide to check out the mall. Maybe Benedict bought more than just a ring. The last shoe store in the mall, a clerk recognizes Benedict's photo. And yeah, he came in just before New Year's, was wearing a perfectly good pair of Air Nikes, hardly used. That's a $140 shoe, you know. And he buys a pair of Fila's, which aren't as good, and he says to me, chuck the Nikes in the garbage. That's when investigators had another stroke of luck. Because of the Christmas holiday, the garbage hasn't been picked up yet. Edie checks the sneakers against the print, checking first for size. They match. And we have now recovered shoes that could be linked uh, clearly to one of the suspects. I could see very clearly that it, precisely this element of the shoe, that little piece of the shoe, has a cut on the end of it. And if I look across on the test impression of the suspect shoe, exactly the same element has exactly the same little cut on the end of it. And I simply continue that process, in this case, marking 10 characteristics, 10 accidental characteristics that I can see in the test impression that are also found in the suspect shoe. I also notice that the general wear is the same on the suspect shoe. I also notice that it's exactly the same size and exactly the same uh, pattern. And my conclusion is that no other shoe in the world would have created this mark on the staircase except the suspect shoe. The pieces were now falling into place. Based on what they now knew, the OPP arrested Frank Lanou. He was fingerprinted, and his prints checked out against the prints found in Benedict's car. They matched proving Benedict had been lying when he said he didn't know Lanou. Well, you're probably thinking it's all wrapped up. Think again. Unless investigators could determine which one of the two perpetrators was the gunman, they might both walk. Judy Johnson had identified the gunman as the one wearing the ski mask. Was it Benedict or Lanou's face behind the shooter's mask? The masks had been recovered the day after the shooting, a half a mile down the road, and sent to the Center of Forensic Sciences to be analyzed for DNA. DNA is the most revolutionary development of the century in forensic science. DNA is found in virtually every cell of our body, including hair, teeth, and all bodily fluids. Scientists had found traces of saliva inside the mask. These were analyzed by the lab and compared to samples taken from each of the suspects. One of the suspects, while being interviewed, 
had smoked a cigarette in the police cruiser. Not only is smoking bad for you, but your saliva is loaded with DNA. When they compared results, they now knew Benedict had worn the Elvis mask. By the process of elimination, Lanou was the shooter. At the trial, prosecutors presented the masks, the gun, the casings, and the marked money, and the fingerprints in the car. All of this tied Lanou to Benedict, but it was circumstantial. It was this, Exhibit A, that clinched the case. The fact that their prints were found on the stairs going up to Johnson's bedroom proved they'd been in the house that night of the shooting. Before Jim Eady could even testify, the defense lawyers pleaded their clients guilty. Thieves aren't uh, that committed to uh, doing a good job, uh, is my experience, and they always make mistakes, and the mistakes tend to compound on each other, and uh, I find that if I can see that in the crime scene, if I can spot those errors in the crime scene, then uh, those are the opportunities, the windows of opportunity that I focus on to, uh, to find uh, good evidence. Benedict and Lanou were sentenced to six years in the penitentiary. As for Alec Johnson, he would need years to recover from the brain damage from the shooting. This was a case where a dedicated forensic scientist stopped a couple of bad guys cold in their tracks. The stories on Exhibit A are based on actual cases. The names of the victims have been changed to protect their identities. The names of the guilty are real. Enter the world of forensic science, the science of crime, where a suspect's guilt or innocence can hang on a single piece of evidence. How much does science really know about sleep or dreaming? Or how they intersect with our waking world? Exhibit A, the mystery of sleep. The last thing John Greer remembered was falling asleep watching Saturday Night Live. Then he had these weird flashes. He's mother-in-law with a help me look on her face. Yelling kids, kids, trying to warn them about something. The sound of a phone beeping off the hook. Then coming awake in his car and seeing a bloody knife beside him. If this was a nightmare, he desperately wanted to wake up. Then the horror dawned on him. He drove to the nearest police station where he blurted out, oh my God, I think I just killed two people. The police sped to his in-laws. 
They found John's father-in-law still alive with serious knife wounds to his back and head. His mother-in-law had been stabbed five times and hit with a tire iron. An hour later, John's wife, Lisa, is awakened by two police officers. They break the news that her mother has been murdered and that her husband is the murderer. It doesn't make any sense to her. In the six years she'd known John, he never once showed any violent tendencies. They had met in high school. She was a rebellious teenager, and he encouraged her to reconcile with her folks, especially her mother. To John, Lisa's parents were like the Brady Bunch, the family he always wished he had. And he'd always been particularly close to her mother. It just didn't make any sense. When Lisa finally brings herself to visit John in jail, she expects answers. Why did he attack them? Why did he drive 20 minutes in the middle of the night to her parents' home? What happened? John can't answer any of it. Even his severely damaged hands are a mystery. Lisa leaves angry and confused. From this point on, there would always be two juries judging John, the one in the courtroom and the one in his wife's heart. He resigned himself to this inevitable fate, a divorce from Lisa and a conviction for first-degree murder. The attack didn't sound like something John would do not to John's grandmother. So she hired John, one of the best criminal lawyers in the country, Marlis Edward. He was deeply uh, sad, uh, tearful, and he was very clear that he did not remember. Uh, he did not understand what had happened. He did not know if he was responsible for the death of his mother-in-law and the you know, severe stabbing of him and wounding of his father-in-law. Uh, so really all he could say in the most compelling of ways was, I'm confused, I'm frightened, I, I don't know why I'm here, I've damaged my hands, I've, you know, his hands were very badly injured by obviously handling a knife of some kind, uh, and I don't know what happened. Why was his memory so sketchy about such a horrendous attack? Was he faking? Or was it some form of temporary insanity? She called Ronald Billings, an expert in forensic psychiatry. Well, I was puzzled because he was, he was depressed, but he was depressed because of what happened. There was no evidence of any kind of delusional thinking and he didn't have a long history of antisocial behavior, and he was not an aggressive person. Um, his nickname was the Gentle Giant. Uh, so there's really, there was nothing, there was nothing. He didn't show, the, there was no personality disorder. He wasn't psychopath. Um, it was just a puzzle. Meanwhile, the police had a strong case. His father-in-law could identify John as the attacker. They had also found the murder weapon in John's car. And they had his confession when he entered the police station. Then what would explain the attack? I look to some external uh, circumstances that would give clues. And one of them is the absence of any motive. I mean, there was no insurance policy, there was no money, there's no anger, uh, and you can't find a reason. And we, we found, I think, a clue, and a very important clue that started to move us in direction of, exp of exploring sleep disorders. When we received from the Crown a copy of his statement to the police. In our law, uh, we provide for, and it's rarely 
been successful, a defense of non-insane automatism. Sleepwalking is one variety of that. Sleepwalking. Many of her colleagues found it far-fetched. Others, ridiculous. A jury would never believe it. Nobody would. Would you? Marlis Edward wanted to know as much as she could about sleepwalking. Searching for an expert, she found one close to home, Roger Broughton. Marlis got permission for Broughton to set up a temporary sleep lab in a parole office. Technicians would monitor John's brain waves, eye movements, muscle tone, and blood oxygen. There are two uh, qualitatively different uh, types of sleep. Uh, the first type we refer to usually as non-REM sleep or synchronized sleep or sometimes quiet sleep. And the other type uh, we refer to as rapid eye movement sleep or REM sleep, also called paradoxical sleep and, and active sleep. Uh, there are significant differences uh, between these two types of sleep, which are really as different from each other as either is from wakefulness. Sleepwalking occurs in deep sleep, the lowest of the four levels of non-REM sleep. Yeah, in, in normal subjects, when we study their sleep, they very rarely go from the deepest stages of non-REM sleep, from what we've called slow wave sleep, to wakefulness. It's quite rare. Dr. Broughton observes John Greer immediately sinks down to level four, deep sleep then suddenly shifts to wakefulness without passing through any of the other three levels. One or two such shifts per night is usual. Here in this uh, first study, uh, he had, I think it was four or five, one, two, uh, three, uh, four, so four here. So this is fairly characteristic of sleepwalkers. Experts believe sleepwalking is an incomplete arousal from sleep. The person has their eyes open, but they're like a robot, carrying out some deeply embedded internal program. That's why sleepwalking is often made up of familiar actions. There was a man who used to cook entire meals while asleep. He would grunt like an animal at these times, and his family learned not to wake him because he would become aggressive. In the morning, the man could never remember any of it. Not only was the man a sleepwalker, but his children and grandchildren had a high incidence of sleepwalking. In fact, when his grandson was six, he tried to climb out a sixth floor window in his sleep. The sleepwalking cook was John's maternal grandfather. The grandson who tried to climb out the sixth floor window was none other than John Greer himself. He also had other sleep dis disorders which frequently cluster with sleepwalking, which include uh, sleep terrors, of which he had had in the past, uh, sleep talking to a certain extent, and a pattern of very deep sleep. So personal circumstances and family history are two of the preconditions of sleepwalking. Others are stress and exhaustion. To understand how these might have had an influence on John, defense scrutinized the days leading up to the murder. John and Lisa had married in their teens. Within two years, they'd saved enough to buy a car and put a down payment on a house. Life was great. Then one weekend, they went with another couple to the Queen's Plate. John's horse won and paid $45. John thought he had the knack. He knew Lisa dreamed of going to Australia. He thought he'd play the horses just until he won enough to send her there. Within a year, his dream became a nightmare. He started losing, then stealing small amounts from his employer to cover his losses. In time, he embezzled $32,000 and was caught, fired, and charged with theft. He spent a night in jail. Lisa and her folks stuck by him. No one would hire him. 
With Lisa pregnant with their first child and to stem her financial anxieties, he lied that he had gotten a job. Then he started playing the horses again, believing somehow that he could win enough to repay his employer and bail himself out of trouble. This time when he started losing, he borrowed from loan sharks and stole from his wife's bank account. The murder had taken place on Saturday night. The pressure began building that Thursday. That's when Lisa was notified that one of her checks had bounced. Assuming it was a mistake, she inquired at the bank. They showed her a stack of checks with her signature. With a sickening feeling, she realized they'd been forged by John. That night, she screamed at John and banished him from their bedroom. He couldn't sleep that night. Then on Friday, Lisa discovered he'd been lying about having a job and that they were more in debt than she'd imagined. She had never been so angry. Alone, he couldn't stop worrying that she'd leave and take their new baby. And he couldn't blame her. He couldn't sleep that night either. On Saturday, after being awake 48 straight hours, he played rugby, hoping it would make him tired enough to fall asleep. When Lisa came home from work, he expected she would demand a divorce. Instead, she told him they'd sell the house, repay his employer, and start all over again. John couldn't believe it. He would have to come clean with her parents. That would be one of the hardest things he'd ever have to do. He feared he'd lose their love and respect. But if that was the price of keeping his marriage together, he'd do it. That night, Lisa asked him if he was coming upstairs to bed. He said he'd sleep downstairs until all of this was behind him. As he settled down to watch the end of Saturday Night Live, he believed they'd weathered the storm. But if life up until now had been a nightmare, it was to become a living hell. When John Greer fell asleep that night, he'd been awake for 60 hours. 60 hours reliving the awful events of the past three days. 60 bleary hours of agonizing stress. So yes, on the night of the murder, John Greer was a prime candidate for sleepwalking. But would a jury believe it? Would they believe that he had driven 20 minutes on a superhighway and committed two ghastly attacks while sleepwalking? Exhibit A, to sleep, perchance to sleepwalk. The judge in this case had three questions for the jury to decide. Did John Greer cause the death of his mother-in-law? And if he did, were the acts causing the death conscious and voluntary? And if the acts were not conscious and voluntary, what crime was committed? We knew we had to put forward a thorough and exhaustive case, one that would convince a rational person so that, you know, they wouldn't walk away saying, this is ridiculous, this is incredible. It had to be, you know, enough evidence that 12 ordinary people in the community would look at it and say, this is the only explanation. John's final thoughts before falling asleep that fateful Saturday night might have been filled with anxiety about meeting the next day with his in-laws. Deep in sleep, an hour or two later, which is when most sleepwalking occurs, he might have started acting out the next day's events. How else to explain why he left the house without socks or underwear? The first time he'd ever done that. Or why he'd left the front door wide open, 
another thing he'd never done before. Then he started driving on a super highway to his in-laws, a route he'd driven hundreds of times. Is driving a more complex action than John's grandfather's cooking entire meals? No one could be absolutely positive about the next events. How John got in is not clear. One could imagine his mother-in-law seeing him at four in the morning and trying to figure out what was going on. Perhaps, as happens with sleepwalkers, she'd physically tried to get his attention, and he became aggressive. Terrified, she might have run into the kitchen and tried the phone, which didn't work because the extension had been knocked off the hook. Perhaps that's when she reached for the knife. John's father-in-law testified that he woke up with John choking him. He hadn't remembered John saying anything before he blacked out. Perhaps that's when John's mother-in-law returned and John had taken the knife from her, blade first, which is how his hands got cut to the bone. Perhaps that's when he had his flash of her face with the help me expression before he attacked her with the knife. Around that time, one of the girls came out onto the landing and called out to see what was going on. The girls testified they heard grunting. John's grandfather used to grunt when he cooked in his sleep. Then he remembered coming awake and seeing the bloody knife next to him. More time had elapsed since he'd left the house than most sleepwalking incidents. Then there was his confusion at the police station when he blurted out, my God, I've just killed two people with my hands. Then he added, I killed them. I don't know why. By the time Marlis Edward presented her case in court, four other psychiatrists testified that John Greer was sleepwalking when he stabbed his mother-in-law to death. In an emotional victory, Lisa finally believed but even if he was sleepwalking, was he still guilty of first-degree murder? Had he programmed himself while awake to kill his mother-in-law in his sleep? There's no evidence that one can create a motivation uh, in wakefulness uh, as a sleepwalker uh, in a way that would um, carry over in, in sleepwalking. Marlis Edward argued that yes, John Greer had caused his mother-in-law's death, but that neither a first or second degree murder or manslaughter charge applied. Since the prosecution had failed to present beyond a reasonable doubt that John's actions were voluntary and conscious. The jury deliberated for nine hours. When the judge asked, members of the jury, have you agreed upon your verdict? The jury foreman stood up and replied, we find him not guilty. Greer was free. I was committed to a person who I believed if, if he had been convicted, um, would have been wrongly convicted. And that in itself is the real benefit and the real joy of doing criminal defense work when you think you get the right result and the just result. He and Lisa tried to put their shattered lives back together again. But after a few years, they filed for divorce. As far as is known, John Greer had never again acted violently in his sleep. Was it a freak of nature? A one in a billion occurrence? I, I think we're all uncomfortable with the idea that, uh, that we or another person could have complex behavior uh, of which we're unaware and which is out of our or the person's control. We tend to think if we understand something, it's no longer a mystery. But with sleep and its disorders, the more we understand, the more mysterious it becomes. The stories in Exhibit A are based on actual cases. The names of the victims have been changed to protect their identities. The names of the guilty are real. <laughs>